The late and great Pete Shelley was not only one of the finest songwriters of his generation, but also a cultural game changer. His band Buzzcocks took punk out of London and gave it to Manchester and the rest of the world, before creating the DIY ethic crucial to the times. In this in-depth interview, he explains just how he did this. Hello. Hello, is that Pete? Oh, hello, it's John Rock. Hello, John. Okay, are you alright for a bit of time to talk about punk rock? Yeah, go on. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll make it nice and easy. We're just doing chronological order. Uh-huh. So, just talk about the kind of music you got into um, in the first place when you were a kid. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I was born in '55, so when the when the um, the Beatles happened, um, that's, that was you know the start of uh, being interested in music. Yeah, so the beat was, was that like a big kind of impact? Well, I mean, it, I mean, it was if you looked up north, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. Um, because it was the start of the uh, clash of you know, popular music radio, because before that, you just had uh, you know, the, the, the BBC live service. Yeah. So, about six or seven, when you had uh, Radio One, at the end, because it, it was then, uh, and before that, there was all the pirate stations. As well, because Yancey came back from Australia, she emigrated from Denmark, and came back, I think it was probably about 1964. Yeah. She came back, and uh, <coughs> on the way back, she brought me and my brother a little transistor radio each. Right. So, I mean, that was my first, uh, no, that happened with the transistor radio, you had to listen to music, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> so, was that her intention? <laughs> well, I don't know whether it was or not. Uh, and then I've got another answer to thank the uh, uh, well, well, I was being interested in, in music because I used to, used to go uh, up to a uh, 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 so we'd have two weeks holiday and she was living in Scotland. And so we used to, I was like out in the country, so we used to go up, up there. And uh, of course, being in Scotland, Neil Ock Roman, of course, it rained, wasn't it? Yeah. So many days, uh, she had uh, an old radio gram. And because she was my dad's younger sister, she had, you know, she had bought records and still buying records. So she had like three tools and fairly things or something. As well as well, so all the things going back to Lonnie Donegan and stuff like that. So uh, I tend to be a DJ and just sit there playing all these records again and again. So at so what point did there, so you, you got interest there, just so at what point did pop culture kind of impinge on you more than that? I, I mean, I, as the 60s, the developed, uh, the Beatles became more, more iconic. It just suggests like that until about 1970. Well, in, in 60, Christmas of 68, I think it was, when I first got a record played me on. Um, the single I bought was Hey Jude. Right. But uh, I bought it in October and we didn't get a record back. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just used to take that to the sleeve and look at it. So there's that thing, there's this thing that the, that the single was being, a, you know, a, an object. Yeah, I mean, that's what it was like, wasn't it? Yeah. Years ago, yeah, whereas now it's just nothing in it, but then it was like an artifact, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it was, you know, it was, well, I mean, like, it served groove and you know, all that music and there's ways to get out. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and the first album I got was Sounding Pepper, because, I mean, at that time, that was the... The album which Shepard would see for the new event from the Tesla party. Yeah. Then they'd probably have that, you know, Sergeant Pepper and people who were playing it today. So it's one of those, um, you know, that, that, that sort of milestone in music. So I suppose so, so, so from then I, I got interested in but that side of, of music, really. You know, so I mean, like, uh, the. It, uh, because the album was more social event. Yeah. Because you only listen to music on your own, you run into people's houses and listen to music. And you don't tend to listen to the same <laughs> kind of music. Yeah. Uh, and then in about 1970, I think it was. Yeah, probably about 1970. Well, well in, in my diary, because my brother used to have a, an acoustic guitar. Yeah. And uh, he never played it. Um, for some reason, it was raining on it was Lee, and it was raining on uh, on, on, on I, I can't remember the fourth or the fifth of January. Right. I've, I've mentioned this before. But, uh, 
Um, it, well, I said it was the 4th of January, and it said, it said uh, today I've decided to split, but uh, if today's raining, I've decided to learn to play guitar. Right. Because he had the little book, you know, that I to play chords and everything. So uh, I tuned up the guitar because we had a piano, which is in, in, inherited from my grandma. Because, like, and you could, you could tune straight away? And uh, so, I mean, I managed to, to work out what notes and things to, to tune up the guitar. And started learning to play guitar. And then at the same time, doing a second-hand record stall in me, not short in me. And, uh, and I went in and I, and I managed to get all the Beatles, uh, the, all the Beatles singles. Yeah. Because it's only about like five P a time, you know, you're paying for the, 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 the um, and the old, old singles. So, so, so with my pocket money in my paper room, and I managed to, uh, I just, to throw up a collection of them. And then these books you could get were, it, it, it would teach the Beatles hits, but, you know, the easy way to play them. Yeah. You know, rather than being complex. So I used to get that and play along with these, with these Beatles songs. And me and uh, a, a friend at school had the idea of uh, like having a band so we used to uh, practice, you know, Beatles songs. So it all progressed like that until about 1971. I had to around that Easter, I think it was. And, um, but it was, it was then when uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex, who was my T Rex, yeah. and they released Hot Look. And I went to the place that bought that. And also bought myself a ticket to go and see him at uh, Free Trade Hall. Um, and that was uh, 16th of May, 71. Yeah. And I went to all that, and that was it. I was kind of, I was going back home about the next day, and so I thought maybe something. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and I bought a, uh, 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 you know, the T-Rex one, the one and a half. They gave all these. Yeah. And, uh, and started playing along with that. So because by then, I realised that I could actually listen to music and actually work out what the chords were. So was glam rock quite uh, an influence on you then? Or just uh, T-Rex? Well, I mean, I suppose so, because, it, I mean, it was like we were saying, uh, saying yesterday, so go back to basics. Yeah. The type thing. Because... Um, any guitar solo which uh, Mark Allen was playing was anything that, you know, anybody could play and I could play. Yeah. And, 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 in, in, and also it was, it was like, again, full of humour and, you know, and, um, you know, daring do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're fantastic, were the T Rex? Yeah. So, what other bands that period did you get into? Was it mainly T Rex or did you? Well, it, well, it started off with T Rex and then. Well, I, I suppose it was in the year. Um, it was uh, it was David Bowie because by seventy two, by May seventy two, the doctor had said the uh, first star on. Yeah. And I thought, wow, that's a great song. Yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? And um, and uh, and of course, then that album became you know the one which I would uh, 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 I would play and listen to. Uh, so so I mean so I was gravitated towards the more quirky things. Which, uh, I mean, it's always ones that tend to shock people. Yeah. Um, I mean, it tends to be more the wall type things that, happen, uh, that I would like, you know, rather than, you know, the mainstream and the, and, and the, the, the things which would make you seem cool to your friends. So, so I mean, I, I mean, I would say more outrageous. Um, I also remember at anyway, that time that I saw, I saw Alice Cooper on uh, on the Old Girl Whistle Test. Yeah. And, and it wasn't long after that I went there about uh, the, 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 the killer on. Uh, but that was before he became uh, that mainstream. Yeah. Because, I mean, it was about 70, 273 when he did school there, wasn't it? But, but so it was like uh, before that. It was when he was still more punky rather than being, uh, uh, well, I mean, that overly uh, theatrical. Yeah. 
Um, and in the same way with Roy as well. I mean, before he became, I, I, I mean, I saw him, I think it was, yeah, must have been 72. Uh, yeah. When he played in Manchester, they just had the John and Wally dancing and then deleted. So it was, it, it was before he became, the, the, you know, the full, you know, chameleon struck butterfly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's still, you know, a bit, um, that edgy, really. Well, that, well, I mean, it was, it, it was something which was, which, uh, I just did shock. <laughs> yeah. So, so, I mean, like, things like wearing, um, that makeup at school, you know, when you're in the sixth form, it's not, <laughs> the normal thing, but it was a good, thing. It, 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 it was a good guise. But, uh, you know, to go, uh, so it was like, um, it, I mean, it was a form of rebellion. Yeah. As well as actually uh, conforming to a certain degree. Yeah, to a different kind of conforming. Yeah. <laughs> like, <they're> non conforming. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did you like all the things about the blurred sexuality of glam rock as well? Uh, yeah, well, 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 I mean, that took me down to a T because then I didn't have to make any, <laughs> didn't have to make any decisions. Yeah. I mean, I guess uh, growing up in Lee, that's not um, something that's considered well, very much. Well, in a rugby town, so... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get the pictures of them. I mean, I, I mean, there weren't many... But, but, I mean, I mean, it's like Little Britain, you know, being the only gay in the village, but I mean, <laughs> I was the only glam in the village. <laughs> And did people give you grief or did they just leave you alone a bit? Or? Well, no, no, I mean, some ways did, I, I mean, I found it actually worked in my favour that instead of me feeling intimidated, it made other people feel intimidated. Right, right. I suppose people respect you for standing up for something, wouldn't they? Well, no, but it was a bit of a, um, I mean, a bit of a shot. I mean, there's a, I mean, there's a similar kind of thing in Quentin Crisp, you know, where it's, you know, they feel like they're more afraid of you than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you are, then, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I mean, the, uh, I mean, it was uh, an interesting time in that, especially when you know, especially when you're young and uh, no, and there's so many options to explore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you, you kind of go through the glam rock thing, and then um, is it a bit of a jump to when you go to Bolton Tech, or is this all about the same kind of thing? Um, well, this is just I've done just before I went to the Lee Boys Glam Rock. Yeah. So uh, by the time, well, I mean. I mean, but I mean, I was listening to sort of like, uh, I mean, a lot of German stuff as well. Like Cannon groups like uh, that? Yeah, Cannon. Did yeah. you get to all those via Bowie? Was he kind of open the doors here? Well, there's that. I mean, he, he was always good at name dropping. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's how Kerber Cox, uh, the Velvet Underground, defended me. But uh, their girlfriend had, uh, had the Velvet Underground album because I'd been talking about it and the events and this. I made a, a pair to them. And, uh, and that's how I got into. Uh, the whole Velvet Underground thing. I mean, it was from other uh, helpful, uh, you know, part of it. Yeah. So from the Velvet, you get into Cannes and stuff like that? Uh, well, it's too bad. I mean, I mean, it's like Peel, you know, Peel. Yeah. They can't have sessions on. And, and I liked it because it was, again, it was, it was off the wall. It was more challenging. It was, <laughs> it wasn't just, you know, trying to be like status quo. Yeah. So you're quite a good musician by this point. You've been playing for quite a few years, I guess, now, haven't you? Three or four years. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, well, I mean, I mean, I wouldn't say I was any better than I am now, but... <laughs> <laughs> but you got to a level where you could write songs. I mean, you are, are you writing songs at this point? Uh, yeah, well, well, I first started, started writing songs when I was, like, I'd be, I'd be 16. It was about the same time I did middle level. Yeah. Um, and the June that summer, I was, I was writing lots of stuff. I mean, it's not the day, like, uh, but... Yeah. It's really too bad, you know, But, uh, um, I mean, it was tough, which I knew, like, I could actually do, once you write your first song, and, you know, everything else is a, is a dog or something. Yeah. So, um, so by the time... Well, I'm going to in, in 73, that's when I uh, actually started getting a, a band together. Which, is, but, but which after this uh, their physics experiment, I ended up calling the Jets of Air. The Jets of Air, yeah. yeah. That sounds like. So you know it's. Quite futuristic, yeah. Yeah. Sounds quite futuristic in some way. Yeah. 
<laughs> so was it was the scene very different when you went down to London? Did you feel? Oh, I mean, it was more it, it was more passion conscious. Yeah. Um, up in because I mean I mean there wasn't really a a strong sense of what punk style was. Yeah. So the I mean, sentence is punk, you know, you want to know what, you know, how to suggest what to wear. So what kind of things were you wearing at the side? Um, oh, there's a picture of me for that screen on the green thing, and I got this pink lab coat. Yeah. Um, um, uh, this, this rip, um, so it, it made it look a bit like a, a Japanese print t-shirt. Yeah. So, but, you know, I think, but, but I mean, I, I think it was like, uh, you know, one of those, those comic book print type things. Yeah. So it's lots of things, but they're just they're ripped up. And you know, I've just, I mean, I'm, I'm a really shocked. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have your guitar, sawn in half guitar at this point? Uh, well, it wasn't sawn in half. That's what Martin McLaren always said, it was sawn in half. The top sawn off, though, wasn't it? Well, no, no, the top actually broke up when I threw it across the wall. Oh, right, I thought it was deliberate. No, no, oh, no. I took it off and I was like, ah, you know, because it was only £18 a guitar, which is all. Yeah. Which, um, in those days, you could, you know, I mean, you could buy one for more worth for £20, but this, <laughs> this is £18 and it was fake, man. Yeah. <laughs> it came with a cardboard uh, carrying case as well. Right, oh, so it's, uh, it's had all the mod cons, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I was uh, you know, doing a authentic, uh, a, a punk, in inverted covers so a lot. And, uh, and I took it off and threw it on on, uh, on the floor. And it skidded on the floor in two bits. Yeah, and you didn't have another 18 pounds to get another one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, so was... I picked it up and it still worked. So I thought, oh, it's a billion. Yeah, because it looks, it looks really good. It's kind of kind of mini iconic punk mm. thing, isn't it? And it was, you know, this idea that, you know, that it's not about, you know, having, well, being able to afford a proper guitar. Yeah. Because that's what everybody used to, uh, you know, uh, aspire to, really, if, if you were a guitarist. Yeah. And the idea was to be able to play good and to have, you know, you know, the hot phone. And I just had this, uh, the, you know, this 50 quid amp and some speakers that uh, had the got my dad to make for me. Yeah. You know, some, some speaker cap. And, uh, and that was it. I was aware then. And yeah. then we got invited to the second night to the Hungry Club. Yeah. Um, so, so that was the night with the Sid Vicious. Oh, you were there for that one, yeah. But, uh, yeah. but we've been out again from the tweet. Right. And we came back and just being holed up into a police van and that was Sid Vicious. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so I missed the whole uh, incident. And I've only got the, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 the headlines to drug my memory on that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, did you know these people at the time? These? Uh, no, not really. I mean, the other people we knew was the, you know, the, the immediate, uh, you know, tech officials, entourage. Yeah. Um, and the people we used to see in the audience, like Susie and uh, Billy Idol. And, yeah. Because uh, we remember seeing Susie with a swastika armband and the brown pants is, uh, on the, uh, the, uh, the screen on the green. Yeah. Because that was really the first, like, national event. Yeah. I mean, that's when there was this little part from, from uh, Newton, Swansea or Cardiff. Yeah. And he was the one who had the earring and the, the cheek piercing on all the Yeah. And had the chain linking them together. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that was really the first time people started, you know, were going. And it was also a thing of the checking out the audience. Because yeah. it, was, it, it had just started becoming where they, the the audience would become the you know the band. So it was kind of this gig and you know part of the, the, the Bromley contingent, and then uh, about a month later, that's the uh, Susan the Banshees gig for the, for the night before we played at the uh, Under Club. Yeah. So, so it was really these same people, and next week they'd be in the band. So was was at this point now? Do you feel like you were part of something or? Uh, yes, yes. I mean, this, I mean, there seems to be more and more of a critical map building up. Yeah. That I mean, I mean, 
and they walk into that and just couldn't, you know, like ignore and go all that way, you know. If I don't do it, this is not going to happen. It was like for keeping up with what was, uh, for, for what was going on. Yeah. And I think it was, but, I mean, um, then after that was when uh, Tony Wilson was doing So It Goes. Yeah. And, uh, and it, uh, and uh, it, the invited to fix this was up to play. So, I mean, that was, you know, around about that time, you know, there, there, there seems to be more things happening. And then people saw Texas was on television, you know. And that's when it just completely went overground, wasn't it? Well, no, well, it was really the Bill Grundy thing. Well, I'll, I'll say it goes before you yeah, kick in the lineage yeah. here, yeah. 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 Once, oh. <laughs> yeah. Once the Bill Grundy thing, then it was some page news then. So how did that affect you? What were you doing? Well, well, I've, well I mean, it was like when Faust became famous. You know, and I was, I, I, you know, and I, I was, I was the kid in, at school, and you. <laughs> oh, so you were the hip kid, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and then, you know, people have, you know, that's when people's conception of what punk is, they say, you know, as it comes together. Yeah, it got formed. Yeah, just yeah. something different. And because then people, um, as it became confronted with this idea, it was hard to escape it because big four. Yeah. I mean, even now with that, I mean, I watched that film, couldn't you think, but I didn't see it at the time, being in Manchester, but... <clears throat> yeah, so well, people always forget this, he wasn't actually on outside uh, London, was it? Yeah, yeah. And people go on about it like it, it was a national shock, yeah. but... <laughs> and then these idiot provincials smashed the telly, but nobody outside London actually saw it, did they? <laughs> <laughs> and also, I mean, uh, I mean, I don't think anybody watched it. <laughs> <laughs> The news anyway. Yeah, I mean, that's all it was, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And the way it's portrayed now, it's like it's on the national news or something, yeah. isn't it? So, yeah, you said about watching it two years later. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, if you watch it, I mean, it, I mean, it really was Bill Grundy's fault. And, you know, John Lydon said, you know, well, read words, you know, like, you know. I'm sorry, yeah, he apologised, he's like a little kid, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really unshocking now, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And also people's reaction to it as well was really odd. But I mean, like, I mean, in those days, I used to say, you used to, to stop traffic, you know, by what, you know, by what you were wearing. Yeah. Even just wearing non-flared jeans would stop traffic, you know? Yeah. Um, it was seen as, but, but, I, mean, I mean, there was a greater degree of conformity than, it'd be, it'd be hard for us to imagine now what it was like. Yeah. Then, you know, and everybody was walking around looking like, I don't know. I mean, the only other thing is Buffy walking around looks like Bear City Roller VJ. Yeah, people have like, people ever had long hair, didn't they? If you, had, if you didn't have uh, your hair over your ears, people thought you were a weirdo, didn't yeah. they? Yeah, yeah, that was it. I mean, just have short hair and seen as, you know, a, a, a real bold gesture. Just the same way that, I mean, less that sort of uh, uh, but ten years previously, the Beatles once they went up, down to the collar, you know, it was, <laughs> you know, that was the end of society. We had the uh, shorter of the collar, then it was, uh, you know, it was people it seen as being shocking. It is strange, isn't it, what people think? Yeah. So, so, so your song, you, you've, you've already got the song written on, are you still writing through this period as well, or? Well, well no, I mean, I mean, I mean, by the time we got, uh, you know, the full band, we had about half an hour set. Yeah. That just grew and grew. Um, I mean, I did about 12 gigs of us in, in 11 to 12 gigs. Uh, in total, in the, in the six months from uh, Princess of July till the, the last one he did was uh, for, the, uh, for the Anarchy Tour. Yeah. Uh, it was December in uh, 76. Yeah. So it was only a short. Uh, <coughs> Uh, you know, at the time. So what was the reason he left? Why did he leave? Uh, well, he was in his final year at uh, college. Right, I mean, it seems weird from the outside because it looks like your band's about to really take off here. Well, <laughs> yeah, but you just had to take this and can't play anywhere in Britain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You've just been swearing on telly. Um, well, it uh, seems, seems like a big national excitement. Well, there's, just, there's some kind of excitement going on here, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's exciting, but there is no, you know, there's, there's seemingly no future in at all. Yeah, the authorities are clamping down on on it. Um, and so, it, I mean, it didn't really seem like anything was going to happen. And so, I mean, I was in this final year, 
and his, uh, his coach chooses his head well, you know, either you spend the next three months working and uh, try and get your degree, or oh, that's it, you know, you've, um, <laughs> you've stuffed it. <laughs> well, I see, you got talked out of a rock and roll stardom. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, what can happen with it, you know, is, you know. Is there going to be any, you know, whatever? That's not this. That, I mean, no, I mean, it seems to be a very sensible choice, really. <laughs> 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 I mean, it was easy for me because I wasn't doing anything. Yeah. To carry on not doing anything and, and, and see what happened with it. But for me, the, you know, the obvious way, there's no, like, you know, there's no, uh, that, that fallback position for me. So... So when you went back to the rehearsal room after Howard left, was it like, what are we going to do now? Or did you have a pretty clear idea that you're going to take the vocals? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, so we thought, well, I mean, we get to the end and it's going to be, it's going to be, I mean, I don't know even the flavour of the band, you know, because if you have a singer in, yeah, he'd have to be like Howard. Or oh, he'd start stamping his own, you know, idea. Well, ideas what, did you actually consider thing. getting a singer yeah. or something? Was there any consideration of anybody, or was it...? Um, I mean, we had, so we had a couple of calls. So there's, uh, 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 there's, uh, there's Rob from the prefect. Oh, yeah, I heard he... Did he go up for an audition? Yeah. Well, I don't know if he went up for an audition or whether or not he just thought... I can't remember. Yeah. I don't remember anything, but he was like, you know, well, we don't want to get anybody out there. Yeah. Because, I mean, I can think so. Yeah. And so then we got E. Carp, uh, playing the bass. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Second time in book club. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, but Steve was a bit reluctant bass player, only, I mean, only got a bass because his dad tried to, but it, it fell off the back of a lorry. Right. <laughs> so I got guitar here and Steve looked at it and it's got four strings. He's like, oh, so like, great. Uh, yeah. I'm more likely to get a job in a band with four strings than I am with six because everybody plays guitar. Yeah. And bass players was pure of them. Yeah. So yeah. So you got the. So, so now you, then you get the record deal. Well, no, no, actually, put out. Uh, we missed out Spout Scratch, haven't we? Well, yeah. I mean, Spout Scratch is the let the I mean, how it swung from as far as the band was concerned. We actually recorded more tracks now, didn't we? Because the whole Times Up album, didn't we? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, in October that year, that's when we went in to do the Times Up thing, and we went in on a Saturday afternoon. Was the plan to actually record the whole lot? Just, just trying to record everything you had. Well, no, it was, it was, it was just doing demos so we could hear it. Because, um, I mean, because we didn't have any, you know, I mean, there was no, like, mini discs. <laughs> and I suppose, I mean, I suppose all we had was, like, a real, real chair recording of the uh, hairballs and things. So it's like we went into a four track and we could get an idea about what we sounded like. Yeah. And so we just went in and just did some demos just so we could see what we sounded like. And then, um, I mean, at that point, we did have an agent. Uh, it ended up being Martin Hammett. Yeah. Because he had this, uh, this music agency called Music Force. Right. And um, so he came up with this idea that there was this band who was supposed to be producing. And how... The, 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 but, but there was some scam where we get down time at the studio and we could do it. Um, but it all fell through. But we were left with this idea, yeah, well, you could make your own record, you know. Uh, so we found out how much it cost to go in the studio and record. And uh, we found out how much it cost to press and where to get the sleeves done. And once we had that information, we were well set to uh, I mean, put out the record. Was there any um, kind of idea? I mean, what, why are you putting out yourself? Because you couldn't get a deal? Or so you uh, didn't yeah. even think about that? Or? Oh, you just didn't know how to get a record deal? Well, we, well, we did. And we thought, well, it's a shame if it all ends tomorrow, if all we've got is a, you know, real to real. Yeah. It wasn't the idea of taking the... I mean, in some ways it was to... Well, to have a record, you know, as, the, you know, um, as, as some kind of document of uh, the thing that we've done. Yeah. But rather than... But thinking it, you know, it, it would tell a lot, you know, because I mean, in those days, a single would, you know, could sell hundreds of thousands, you know, a million copies. Yeah. So we never thought it would sell that. In fact, we only had a thousand pressed up. So it was like a limited edition thing. 
started out with me being a commercial release, you know, there was no idea, you know, that we could uh, compete with um, the established record business. Yeah. But it was a way that otherwise, it was like recording it on a cassette and going in front of those booths where, you, you, you know, you can record a single. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and do it like that. You know, putting the you know your money in the thing and playing the, you're pressing play on the thing. That was the other other idea we had. Once you found out you could actually make a record, and then you know it was such a it was such a, a magical thing. You know, the, you know, the seven inch vinyl, and the fact that we made it an EP so we could get four tracks. On. Yeah. So let's so say it wasn't just you know just you know an A and B side, but it was you know like a mini album in a way, or like an EP used to be. Able to. So inadvertently, you kind of started off the uh, indie DIY. I mean, I know I've seen it been going on for years in music, but kind of yeah, the punk version of it, you kind of kickstarted that by mistake, didn't you? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, that's what I mean, that's the same. I mean, that's the thing about ideas. You know, once you give them to the idea, then they can go and off and do it themselves. You know, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. It's everything you have. <laughs> <laughs> but the record, I mean, it, it went out pretty quick when you did it, didn't it? Uh, yeah, we recorded just after Christmas, and uh, a month later, we had uh, a thousand uh, uh, PCs and a thousand sleeves. So, uh, Howard set up an angle for his lamp on his kitchen table, and we, and we went through them one by one. Sticking them all together. So, we taking them out of the paper sleeves, having a look under the light just to make sure that they were perfect, and putting them into the... Uh, a labour of love. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm ended up rejecting two out of the thousand. <laughs> <laughs> How many times do you have to repross that? Well, we did the, um, the, uh, uh, the geometric progression thing, you know, where we started off with one thousand, and then we turned that into two thousand, and then four thousand, and eight thousand, I think, was the, the, the thing. So it was 16,000 altogether. Which, which, which is incredible, isn't it? 15,000 members. Uh, and by then, it was that gave us the money so we could go on the um, on the on the white right through the smash. Yeah. But well, what was that like? Was that pretty um, amazing? Well, it was excellent because that, this was the first time that punk band. It was the first proper punk tour. Yeah. First one that had to get out on the road and play to the gigs. Yeah. yeah. I mean, rather than the uh, the, uh, the Anarchy tour, which you know, um, you know, had about half a dozen gigs to start off with, and I think we only had about three or four. Yeah. So, so it was you, the prefects, and Subway Sect that tour, was it? Was no, it no, it was, um, well, it, it, the, the actual warm-up of that tour started when, uh, for the first gig that we did without Howard. Yeah. We got asked to play with the Clash at the uh, House and Coliseum. Oh, that's our first time you played, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was, um, yeah, so that was the Clash and, uh, the Slit. Yeah. Uh, Subway for everything and uh, Buscox. Oh, right, right, yeah. But the, but the, there was a few gigs where the prefects played instead of the slate. Yeah. Uh, but there was also the, the other band that was on the bill who was, uh, you know, underneath the uh, Clash and before us, but uh, not, not, I mean, after us, if you know what I mean, uh, was uh, the Jam. Oh, right, I didn't know. We should get they played that tour, yeah. Yeah, but well, I didn't know they started off playing it. But then they thought, oh, we don't really want to be associated with them punks. Right, right. Yeah. So they pulled out. But yeah. We then occupy the, uh, you know, the pole spot. And I think that's when the slip went to join the drone at the top, I mean, at the bottom of, uh, uh, of the list. Yeah. So what was it like that tour? It's always, I always hear a tale of great poverty and stuff. Um, well, no, I mean, it was, it, I mean, it was all new and fresh. I mean, you know, it was the first time I had to go in there and play and gig after gig, you know. Yeah. Before that, the most we'd ever done was like doing two shows over weekends or something. But this was like, you know, playing, you know, the, the four or five shows a week. And and it was going around, and it, and, and it was then you got an idea about how, how, how big this thing had become. Yeah. So it's quite about a thousand a night kind of size venues, is it? Well, no, I mean, I mean, I mean, there were a lot. Uh, I mean, was, uh, in Edinburgh, it was a playhouse, you did. Uh, it was Rainbow in London. Um, yeah, so no, I mean, these were like, uh, well, I mean, like, uh, 
I think Westmonton Pavilion. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're going to play. But, I mean, on, on the whole, it tended to be, yeah, maybe mm-hmm. a thousand, two thousand. Yes, bloody hell. So within a couple of months, it conquered the mushroom to this kind of size, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, well I hope it helped with um, the clash having sold out. You signed at this point now, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I'll be signed, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so is it just you are just looking up for any old punk bands to get their hands on, or? Well, no. I mean, uh, I, I mean, they've already got the stranglers. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they've so already accomplished that. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, no, I mean, we're quite lucky because, I mean, like Andrew Lord is uh, real. He's really good in the actual order. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, I mean, he was the guy responsible for signing Cam for you, like, you know. Yeah, his track record's amazing. Look at the bands he signed up. He's got mm. some really cool stuff, hasn't he? Yeah. And he was also, he, he was, you know, he was, he was, I mean, he was more like, you know, a facilitator rather than being, you know, like, um, a suit. <laughs> yeah. So, but he made it possible for us to do what we did. So, you know, rather than directing and saying, oh, well, I know better, you know. You know, you either do it my way or the highway. Yeah, it just left you to it, really. Yeah. yeah. And you'd say, well, we'll, 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 you know, what do you want to do? And so we'd say, oh, we'll put out a single. And yeah. What single do you want? I said, well, the one which we were thinking of, you know, the second thing after the start of Scratch is all guys are Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> So, so that guarantees nowhere to play. <laughs> and he goes, great. <laughs> and up, 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 well, and, and, and also the fact that was, was Martin Russian who was just started producing, he'd been an engineer, but he was actually working there as A&R. Yeah. Um, and, he would, and he'd asked, he'd asked Martin, no, he'd, he'd asked Andrew Law that he could uh, produce the Stranglers, so he just done the first recording for the Stranglers. Yeah, so he's got a pretty good... we came along, he said, oh, I'll, I'll find him the as well. Yeah. And it, it sounds great, doesn't it? Well, uh, well, I mean, I mean, you know, it definitely had that, uh, you know, fairy dust sprinkled on it. Yeah. Was it? Was it engineered by Alan Winstanley as well? Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's, he's. Really, I think he's strength. He's, he's everything. He's, he's done a lot of good stuff over the years, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah. That was madness. Yeah, yeah. You can kind of hear all the stuff he does. He managed to make everything sound like very poppy, very, very poppy. That was sounding watered down. Yeah. So I mean, the first, the first Buzzcocks album was a great, great album, like. Just because it sounds like a punk record, but it's, it's on, on, with its own sound. You think it's such a narrow constraint of what that sound could be? It's just getting the variation of it. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, it was an exciting sort of experimental time because I mean, like we thought that might have been producing for ages, but really had. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also, he, he, he was fun to work with, and he 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 just you know he'd come up with these ideas, and he'd uh, he found a way of actually making them happen. You know, be like George Martin in that way. Yeah, yeah. You know, to go back to the Beatles. <laughs> yeah. 
So what, what kind of things are you singing about that album? It's, it's, it's a lot of love songs, which is unusual in punk, but they're kind of the love songs of an edge, aren't they? Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't know about uh, love running to Moonlight. Yeah. But the novel, angst and things. Uh, I mean, we had, I mean, on that album we had uh, the, the songs that we've done with, no, excuse me, the other songs that we've done with Howard, so which, you know, we the were part of the set, you know, which I've carried on singing. So things like You Tear Me Up and, uh, and uh, I Love Battery. And, yeah. Um, and then there's other things, you know, uh, no, such as, about the German influence, uh, Paul Speed. Yeah. Uh, things like I Don't Mind. So what, what's I Don't Mind about? Because that's, on one level, that's a very kind of pure kind of love song, isn't it? But there's kind of a little undertone to that, isn't there? Yeah, well, well, well it's both. Uh, I mean, actually thinking that, you know, that they just say that they look good, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it doesn't really, you know. I mean, it's about, it's, it's, it's a bit of paranoia in love. So I mean, sort of, you know, the darker excesses of uh, the mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and these are starting to be hit records, aren't they? Uh, well, yeah, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, from my don't mind, they have to go on to the top of the pop. Yeah. Which is a whole new idea. And you, you, can, you can become a pop band, which is like, was that a bit of a shock? Um, it did become a shock later uh, for that year, because I mean, we really talked about it in 78. Yeah, yeah. It really had a lot, because they all came out in March of 78. And by September, we had book buys, so. Yeah, it's amazing how fast people worked in those days, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And by then, we'd had about four or five singles a bit out. Yeah. And it just really built. So by the time we were doing the book buys, uh, we were playing, you know, sort of, uh, I mean, I might come to Apollo all the time. Yeah. But five venues all over the country. And then I got began a bit. I don't know, I was not you know, really. Well, what for what reason? No, because it, 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 it just accelerated to the point where, I mean, it was, well, it, 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 it's become more pop hysteria rather than, you know, the, uh, you know, the punk idea. Yeah. So, I mean, it was only just over, let's see, I mean, it was just over 18 months from doing the, for the White Riot tour. Yeah. To be in, you know, you know, sort of like, you know, the Jack in Smash It. Yeah. And then it became the thing that you'd say things in the press, and, you know, and life was here, you know, things would change. <laughs> yeah. And they'd be trying, you know, to go back, you know, back, back before. Well, cause I, mean, I mean, there was, there was always an undercurrent of uh, sincerity. I was on to, you know, because part of it was actually the telling it all the time. So, the portraying it all in pop myth. Yeah. Um, and then it became harder to keep in control of that. Yeah. And it became more popular in the whole, you know, yeah, you could tell. Uh, your papers and <laughs> did, did you still feel um, something of a punk rock kind of uh, was punk rock still informing what you're doing by now or is it you kind of wandered off somewhere else where it would well I mean I mean I suppose so but I mean there was never there was never I mean there was nobody actually involved in in punk rock I mean all the poor faces of that punk rock you know what I mean you know the, this idea that because you become a punk you take that out of poverty yeah. Um, but something which came later. Yeah. So that more, um, so, I mean, that more aesthetic um, the side of it. Yeah. So that was something which, you know, was, um, I mean, all this went to, I don't know, the rebellion against what happened. But I mean, everybody was, well, because you find them, punk could become just a part of the, the whole new wave thing. Yeah. It's just still an exciting part of new thing, you know. Um, but, I mean, you know, it tends to be lots of skinny tie bands. Yeah, it's never, never as good, really. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it, 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 it was a different thing, in some ways, of walking through, but it, it was an inevitable part of 
you know, okay, in the process, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was, it, it, it was, it was true dialecticism in, you know, in, uh, in, in action. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so we started to live, you know, but, but we'd become the new thesis, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with people that they rebelled against in different, in different ways, really. So, um, and then came, you know, the, the excess of the drink and the drug. Yeah, did that get, kind of help tear the band up a bit, really? Um, no, it just came in. It took everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you got a handle on it. So you get, you get the third album on the band's past its peak commercially. Well, I mean, there's a change, I think. And, of course, I think, I think, um, uh, expand. Then all your, all your plans were for this further expansion. And therefore, when things stop happening in the way they expect them to happen. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, but so when you come to the difficult third album. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, in some ways, you don't want to do what you've done before, but in, in order to maintain the, the current level of activity, that's precisely what you should be doing. Yeah. It's, it's so when you come to those last singles, you, you, you are really trying to push the uh, format as far as you, you can, aren't you? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean we've got more and more. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're a great run of singles, though. But you're about the same, I mean, at the same time, that's when, uh, you know, Bands Like Madness and the specials, you know, the old two-tone thing, it, it started off. And that's really from people who were, but their first influence in, uh, in punk, has been their first, uh, um, uh, interest in music. And then they've carried on and they're, they're doing other things. You know? Yeah. I mean, if it's successful, the people who you're your success to are extremely fickle. Yeah. And they will they'll turn on a six and go off and listen to something else. Yeah, so it's, yeah. And there's also things, the bigger you get, the less you do. Because it gets harder and harder to wear. Uh, well, no, no, but I, well, I, mean, just, I, mean, I mean, the bigger uh, events you do, then the fewer of them you end up doing, fewer gigs. Therefore, I mean, it's always like momentum progressive. <clears throat> That's the whole thing. It's only when it's, it, it's, um, it's for, for, for like growing as a, as a snowball in effect, you know, and getting bigger and bigger. But the moment they stop to clap, it's all white, really. You get out of the bound at this point. Uh, yeah, well, this is 1981. So, yeah. <laughs> I would skip quite a few years. But, I mean, it, it was... I mean, it was okay when Andrew Lauder left. Yeah. Because then we had Tim Chatfield. And he was, you know, interested in music. But yeah. When Tim Chatfield left, that was it. We, it, it, had become, it had become Liberty United by then. And then it became part of EMI. And when it became part of the EMI, because the people are coming in to deal with it, they're not interested in, you know, in having a record you've sold. Yeah. So, well, I mean, a record you're going to sell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so it became, you know, just like listen to those last three singles and say, well, I don't hear, hear a hit. You know? Yeah. And they go, happened. That's <laughs> 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 the point is it, you know? So they thought, oh, you know, that you'd like you plan for them to have hits, but, but the funny music is to, is to do something for the, the, the thing of doing it. Yeah. And, and for it to be difficult. And not for it to be the same that, that, you know, that, you know, that anybody else can do. Yeah. By, uh, March 1981, that's when I thought, oh, wow. Well, because I started doing so, so what would have been the demo for the Cookstock Source album? Yeah. And, uh... Was that just starting to move in a different direction anyway? Um, well, I mean, the, the songs I had were about, I was thinking, you know, I'd like to do a version of Homo Sapien. Yeah. So I went to Martin Russian studio, and he just got this synth and uh, this uh, programming equipment. So we did a version with that. And, uh, after about... 12 hours or something working on it. 
He turns around and he goes, uh, it's finished, then. Yeah, don't, don't need to uh, stick the guitars. Yeah, about to redo it. It's no longer a demo. You can tell that. Now, that's a good, good track. So we tried to cut the rubber. And for them, played with Andrew Lord, it was now A&R at uh, Island Records. Yeah. And also the old MD um, from um, the from United Artists was now at Island Records as the MD. So we played it to them, and they said, uh, Marlon oh, and Julian. And so we thought, well, this is the way forward. Yeah. So that's yeah. the, 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 the disintegration of Buzz Cops. Okay, this whole, that we could uh, actually put together, you know, something in there which was, again, different and challenging. So you spent some time in the solo thing. I mean, what made you uh, want to refund Buzz Cox? Was it any... Well, I mean, I'd always bump into Steve Diggle when he'd always say, uh, well, we should get the band together because, you know, there's all these other bands that, you know, they were just ripping us off. And, yeah. And things like that. I said, yeah, well, I mean, I let them do what they want to, Steve, you know. I'm happy doing what I do. I'd, 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 I'd always say, well, okay, I'll refund the band if, if the band is with us, go back together again. Yeah. That's impossible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they called your bluff. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. It, 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 well, the, the short of the long story is that, is that in Germany, Steve had been billed as, uh, but he was going out of fire convenience. Yeah. And somebody called Buscock, Steve Diggle Buscock. And then, the flag of convenience, FRC. And, uh, and, and Steve released a single, which is Buscock, FRC. Yeah. And somebody, there's this young kid from America, he was only about 18, and he was putting bands on in Europe. And there's one of the guys who's going to the road crew for him. And he asked him if he was available. And he said, oh, no, I'm doing this gig with Buzzcock. <laughs> we got this call from a friend of a friend who said, he said, there's this guy who wants to have a chat with you. So he, 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 he was passing through London. So he said, OK, we'll have a meet with him. And he said, uh, he said, oh, yeah, well, I said, well, you know, the band's not together. It's just the even this FLC thing. I said, well, I mean, do you really think there'd be an interest in there being, uh, you know, a reunion of sorts? Yeah. And he said, oh, yeah, I think so. And he said, I'll go and uh, speak to uh, uh, you know, some uh, promoters and agents and see whether or not it's possible. So he went to all that, and there's a few things mentioned, but, I mean, not a lot. Then our old age, he got in contact and said, how come you haven't told me? I, I want to do this show. Yeah. That's not actually back together. Yeah. <laughs> it's you know, the you know, And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, we could do this. So he, he put together, it was like a three-week tour of America. And uh, so he thought, well, this, this was, you know, as they could do that possibility. So uh, we found the same and it was a bit like, you know, well, you know, the thought, I mean, we didn't actually say that everybody had agreed, but then again, we didn't give the impression that nobody knew anything. <laughs> yeah. And so we said, oh, yeah, yeah, that seems good. Yeah, I'm free for, for, for those weeks. But, yeah, I could do that. So that's how we, we got it back together. So that was in, in, in 89. So that was uh, 15 years ago. <laughs> so does it surprise you that uh, the longevity of the band? Um... Oh, I mean, I'm not pleased about it. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, I mean, there's it, I mean, it's something which is, is, is there in the songs. You know, the songs haven't, you know, haven't uh, tarnished and, you know, haven't, uh, I mean, if anything, the songs uh, even more and more people have turned us on. Yeah. Uh, you know, they've uh, achieved that status of being classic. 